Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on History of Leaders of Thought. Today we will be doing Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Francois-Marie Arouet, or also known as Voltaire. So you might be wondering why am I not perhaps comparing Leibniz to someone such as Newton because they actually had a dispute during their lifetime. Well, I didn't do this because despite their disputes, they were actually very similar in thought process, similar to perhaps why am I not comparing Voltaire to someone such as Rousseau. Once again, they were actually somewhat perhaps similar in train of thought, whereas Leibniz and Voltaire actually specifically clash on certain issues, um, one most notably. So I thought that that would make a more meritorious um, comparison. So without further ado, let's begin with Leibniz. So Leibniz was a German polymath, and I know we've gone through many polymaths in this series, and you've probably heard of many polymaths, but I think Leibniz, um, uh, perhaps almost above anyone else, exemplifies this feature. He was a logician, a mathematician, and a natural philosopher, and he was in all three categories one of the top in Europe both within his lifetime and probably you could still consider throughout history. He's um, probably the most iconic representation of 17th century rationalism. He conceived differential and integral calculus um, per, most likely independently of Isaac Newton. However, if, if you've done any mathematics um, or any sort of calculus, you would be more familiar with the Leibniz notation, as you can see, especially um, dy over dx as opposed to Newton who uses dy over dt, at least from what I've experienced is more commonly dy over dx. Similarly, for the integral formula, this is just the standard notation. I've, I've never actually come across the Newton uh, notation. But either way, they sort of clashed. But um, I, I like to believe that perhaps, and I do think this is true, both of them independently discovered this and there wasn't much um, plagiarism. But we'll get to that more um, clearly soon. He also came across other laws of mathematics, such as the law of continuity and transcendental law of homogeneity, which were not really until the 20th century um, uh, able to receive mathematical implementations in non-standard analysis. He was the first to describe a pinwheel calculator. He added arithmetic, um, uh, sorry, added uh, multiplication and division to Pascal's calculator, so he was very influential on that and the automatization of mathematics. And his own calculus, the Leibniz wheel, the arithmometer, was um, the first mass-produced mechanical calculator, so he was also a very impressive inventor. I think what I most know him for is his theory of optimism, in that the universe is in a restricted sense defined in the best possible one God could have created. And this is where he actually, um, or I guess him and Voltaire, or rather Voltaire criticized him, but we'll get, we'll get more uh, in more detail on that very soon. Um, can, uh, Voltaire actually wrote a book criticizing Leibniz's theory of optimism that how could, um, it, well, Voltaire simply thought it did not make sense, but um, in in, um, in Leibniz's mind, it made clear sense, and we'll get to that more clearly. In terms of rationalism with Baruch Spinoza and René Descartes, he's considered one of the three great advocates of rationalism. In terms of modern logic and analytic philosophy, he um, anticipated much of the changes that would be made in these two uh, realms. Um, but However, um, some of his, so uh, modern logic and analytic philosophy was moving more towards using empirical um, evidence, which is that using um, uh, evidence or that using uh, hypotheses and uh, more towards science. However, he still um, prescribed some scholastic traditions, whereas some of his reasons and principles don't really follow an empirical base. They sort of just since they make sense in his mind, he assumed them to be true, um, which I do think to some extent, maybe empiricism might have gone too far into today's society. I had this quote and uh, one of my good friends actually quoted me on this recently in his job, um, without a certain amount of arbitrariness, nothing gets done. So at one point, 
um, not all laws can be proved empirically and you just gotta make some <laughs> make some stuff up that you just know to be true such as I think therefore I am by Rene Descartes so he also defined a binary number system which um, base 2 system which is used um, which is the foundation of modern computers so without um, without Leibniz perhaps I would not be presenting this video to you over the internet let alone through a computer so that was kind of an overview as I usually do now in terms of his actual biography we'll start off with his early life so he was born on July 1st of 1646 in Leib Leib Leipzig, Saxony um, near the end of the Thirty Years War to Friedrich Leibniz and Catherine Schmuck he was baptized on July the 3rd at St. Nicholas Church. His godfather was a Lutheran theologian. So a somewhat of a, a conservative background, one might say. Um, his father, Friedrich, was a professor of moral philosophy, and but he died at his six years old when uh, Leibniz, the younger, was six, six years old. So he inherited his entire library and lived and was raised by his mother. Um, he inherited his father's library. So with this, he learned Latin by the age of 12, and he was exposed to a wide variety of readings. Um, at, at, supposedly, um, an anecdote was that at one point he wrote 300 verses in one morning when he was only 13 years old. Um, 13, 300 verses in Latin, which is, that's a lot of writing for a 13-year-old. Um, at the age of 14, he enrolled in his father's university, and he achieved a bachelor's degree at 15 in philosophy. He wrote on the individualization, and um, uh, and he specifically studied uh, Aristotle, and um, yeah, and uh, Aristotle's thoughts on specificity and numericism. So, in terms of so, firstly, I'd like to note that a bachelor's degree at fifteen, uh, obviously, the education system was a little bit pushed back, but that is still and was still very early. For an individual at that time so that would have already given him some clout and sort of at this point you know you could call it the snowball theory he sort of started snowballing academically at least and probably in terms of fame as well at this point so he wrote in latin obviously as mentioned he also learned french and german because he was in germany at the time um so you could i could i think three languages is probably sufficient to call him a polyglot um i would say four is more common but um he also invented a library cataloging system, which is used in many of Europe's largest libraries today. Um, he also developed probability theory, and um, bio and he also had implications on biology, medicine, geology, psychology, linguistics, and computer science, as mentioned with his binary system. But we'll get to that all later. Back to the actual biography. So he achieved his master's degree in philosophy in two years two years later in 1664 so around the age of 17 which is also still very young his dissertation was an essay of collected philosophical problems of right um, so and he argued for the theoretical relationship between philosophy and the law so at this point he starts i think probably because that was the common thing that i heard a quote i think it was um i think it was peter thiel he said that europe is a and the united states of in effect are countries ruled by lawyers whereas perhaps in other countries such as asia um well that's sorry continents such as asia china and japan their countries ruled uh run by engineers so i think even to in Leibniz's time to climb up the social hierarchy it would probably be best to follow a career in law so that's what it seemed as he, though he was doing um he did one year of legal studies following his master's in philosophy and he achieved his bachelor's in law in 1663 at 18 years old so also very young in 19 at 19 years old he wrote his first book de art combinatoria uh, philosophy philosophy um, which is on habituation theory um, and it this he wrote it and it included some at the start some mathematical concepts but this is before he really took mathematics seriously and really had any education in mathematics but i suppose it was probably alluding to that passion of his um following this though he he was refused at the university a doctorate in law 
So perhaps in the long term of his career, um, the better for him. So he left Leipzig and he went to University of Altdorf, where he was granted the degree and uh, he was even offered an academic post in legal studies. However, at this point comes our first quote, um, my thoughts were turned in an entirely different direction. So maybe at this point, after his first book, he realized um, he was sort of just following what the, the general consensus was or the general flow of society was to become a lawyer, but he, his, his thoughts had already moved in an enti entirely different direction. Um, simultaneously with him um, just being at the cusp of it, I wonder um, if that's... Um, I think that's how it, how it normally works. People, people don't realize that they're following the wrong path until they're right at the gates and then they throw it all away. So that's essentially what he did. His mind moved in an entirely different direction. Um, he said, uh, at this point, he also starts referring to him as Gottfried von Leibniz, which would have implied that he was um, a member of the nobility. However, no documents confirm that. So I think soon we'll see a parallel to uh, Voltaire in that he was also somewhat of a social, higher, uh, social climber looking to sort of circumvent his born class and sort of climb to a, a higher rung. Into his adulthood, his first salaried position was to the Alchemy Alchemical Society of Nuremberg, which he actually knew little about, but given his education, he was, um, it was sufficient to attain that post. He was hired by Johann Christian von Boyenberg, um, who was a de dismissed chief minister of the elector. So, uh, but ultimately he was actually, um, Boyenberg was re reconciled and recommended Leibniz to the elector. So Leibniz went, um, um, hearing of this opportunity to work for the elector, he actually wrote a legal essay to win the favor. And he, um, he was given the post of redrafting the legal code for the elector. So he did manage to get a political post, and he was willing to, once again, delve into the, the science of law to attain this post. In 1672, his um, Boyenberg, the one who had vouched for him, died. However, he remained employed with his widow until 17, uh, 1674, when he was ultimately dismissed. In 1669, he was appointed accessor of the Court of Appeal, uh, another high role, but once again, legal, and um, perhaps not the passion that he was born with, but the passion that he was kind of thrust into. He published an essay under the um, uh, under a pseudonym, similar to Voltaire, and Voltaire used many pseudonyms, arguing for a German candidate for the Polish crown. So I think... Um, we'll start to see that I think he was a bit of a, a perhaps perhaps a German nationalist or at least um, one might one might uh, be able to derive that from the thing that which soon unfolds. Um, so Germany at this time, so this he was born just at the end of the Thirty Years' War, so it was still very fragmented. Um, about twenty years later, at this point, and Louis the um, the Fourteenth. The Sun King, which was the most powerful, he was the one who moved the French um, monarchy from Paris to Versailles in order to centralize the government. Was um, he actually Leibniz proposed that Louis the Fourteenth go on a conquest to Egypt um, in order to divert the attention away from Germany and protect protect Leibniz's home country. Um, so, so in 1672, 1672, he was actually invited to Paris to discuss this um, this mission into Egypt, which was actually really more to uh, Germany's benefit. However, the Franco-Dutch War broke out, and the plan was rendered irrelevant. Um, and colonial supremacy passed on at this point from Dutch supremacy to British supremacy. Um, supposedly, Leibniz, um, sorry, uh, Napoleon's later conquest in Egypt in 1798 might have been a later implementation of Leibniz's plan. So if that be true, that's another huge, huge influence on politics. And uh, yeah, and the, in, while in Paris, while presenting this idea of conquest into Egypt, 
he met Dutch physicist and mathematician Christian Huygen. Um, and at this point, he realized that his knowledge of physics and mathematics was rather patchy, he referred to it. So um, under Christian's mentorship and also through self-study, he, he really delved into physics and mathematics, which were two things that had sort of, as we'd seen, sort of always been a, a sort of passion to him, but just hadn't really been um, perhaps watered or fertilized. He, um, and this ultimately, through this um, spark, led to the discovery of differential and integral calculus, as well as other great discoveries. I guess I'll, I'll note the other one now to get just delve into some mathematics. This is a um, a formula for the Leibniz formula for pi. So this being pi over four equals one minus one over three plus one over five minus one over seven. As, as you can see, each of the um, denominators increase by uh, ec um, by two each time. Um, however, the problem is some of these terms, for example, one over three um, is uh, uh, zero point. Uh, uh, Three, 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 three. So you have to use so many um, uh, terms just to get it accurate. Um, supposedly up to ten thousand terms, and then even then, it's only accurate up to eight decimal places. Whereas, for example, I've memorized pi just for uh, the sake of um, interest to the thirty-first de decimal place. But really, they're even um, today in computer science, which is the field where they're most accurately trying to. Um, measure pi there still isn't um, a, a formula to do it so uh, props to Leibniz for trying um, because it still can't be done today supposedly um, an art, uh, a hypothesis for artificial intelligence which I found was interesting was if you had create if you were to create a computer system whose sole objective was to calculate pi and through this it would perhaps take energy grow itself and that could be the spark for life or any sort of uh, infinite problem or you could also use um, uh, prime numbers as well but I thought that was a fascinating thing but that is just another mathematical discovery or effort of Leibniz that later came um, also in France he met Nicolas Malbroch uh, and Antro Antoine Arnaud um, who were leading French philosophers at the time he also studied Pat Descartes and Pascal, also two very important philosophers, and many parallels could be seen particularly with Descartes and Leibniz, with respect to Descartes and Leibniz. Um, and he read both their published and unpublished work, which is important to note. Um, as in the case of Alexander the Great, supposedly he read a lot, or he got special training from Aristotle that others didn't have access to. So to what extent is Leibniz a reflection of these individuals? Is um, it's hard to say, but yeah. He also befriended German mathematician uh, von. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, sorry, I'm gonna mess up this name, but Aaron Fried Walter von uh, Tichenhaus. 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 I think would be the. But regardless, um, he's less well known. But at the time, he was very famous and more famous than Leibniz, and once again influenced his fascination and facilitated his passion for mathematics. So after this, um, going to Paris and the um, Franco-Dutch war broke out, the need for the Egyptian war was no longer necessary, so um, the elector sent Leibniz and his, ne and his nephew on a related mission to the English government in London. So once again, to probably divert the English government away from the fragmented Germany and pr protect Leibniz's home country. In London, he met Henry Oldenburg and John Collins. He met the Royal Society and demonstrated in 1670 his calculating machine, which could do addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and he was quickly made an external member of the Royal Society. It, uh, the elector died in seven, uh, 1673, so he had to have a new patron. Um, he went to Patriot, uh, Paris and met Mainz. Um, uh, so he, but sorry, he had to go and find a new pat patron, but he did not return to Mainz. Instead, he went to Paris because he found that Paris was more intellectually stimulating than that which he experienced in Germany, perhaps because the larger focus on physics and mathematics at the time, as well as philosophy, as he saw in René Descartes and Pascal. 
Um, however, the French Academy of Science said they had too many foreigners and they were not able to admit him. Um, but later they reluctantly accepted, two years later, um, um, an, from an offer from Duke Jean Frederick and, oh, um, sorry, pardon me, they later accepted um, in quite, a, quite a few years later actually, um, closer to his death actually. So with this he reluctantly accepts an offer from Duke Jean Frederick of Brunswick, um, a counselor in Hanover in 1676. So this is where I actually think perhaps Leibniz's biggest um, implication comes. So there was the, the House of Hanover, which had German roots, which ultimately with George I takes on, uh, where the, uh, ultimately gained the British crown. And Leibniz, given his fame, was heavily facilitatory into this. So I'll, I'll get into this in more detail. So he starts working for John Frederick of Brunswick in Hanover. And Brunswick at the time was rather small. Um, however, with Leibniz there, it ended up being give, adding a huge amount of clout for them. So he was an advisor and friend to Sophia of Hanover, Sophia Charlotte of Hanover, and the Queen of Prussia, as well um, Caroline of Ansbach, Ansbach, that's the Queen of Prussia, um, despite the disapproval of King George I of Great Britain and their spouses and um, the other women's spouses. So it seems like he actually um, ended up winning the favor of the wives and um, daughters of the Hanover family more so than the men, despite him probably benefiting the men more. So uh, what does that have to do with his character? Perhaps maybe he was more of a, a romantic or perhaps maybe he was um, a little bit um, uh, he was less of a suck up, maybe in uh, to use a, um, a an educated word. Perhaps he was not um, as respectful as the House Hanover would have expected of him. At the time, Hanover only had ten thousand people, but Leibniz brought prestige um, to this community. In 1692, the Duke of Brunswick became the hereditary elector of the Holy Romans, and in 1701, the British Act of Settlement. Um, made Electra Sophia and descent of the royal family, um, descent the royal family of England. So after the death of William the uh, Third, the sister-in-law in law Queen Anne, George the First became the first um, essentially German king of Great Britain. Um, he helped promote this act, the British Act of Settlement, and um, uh, despite. Um, yeah, which promoted a pro where the objective of the act was to promote a Protestant English and Irish crown. So switching over from a, a Catholic pre crown previously, um, and occasionally he presented the um, and promoted it in the British Parliament, and occasionally he was even censored as well. But his legal background and his experience with Protestantism being um, from German, Germany where the um, Protestant Reformation occurred due to Martin Luther, he was um, in a strong position to, to weigh in on these ideas. So uh, during this time, although he was um, working on legal matters for the, um, the Brunswicks and the House of Hanover, they also tolerated his efforts on calculus which he was working on, and in uh, 1674 he start um, he started most of his work on calculus, and it was mostly done by 1677. So, and he published his work on calculus in 1684. As well, he was also working on his mathematics at the time. Uh, the two most important in 1682 and 1692 uh, were both published in a journal which he co-authored with a fellow German, Otto Menck. Um, which they started in 1682. Uh, the two most important journals, Acta, well, sorry, the name of the journal was Acta Eruditorium. Um, and um, yeah, that's, I say this is where the bulk of his mathematical publishing also came. And this is probably also because it was the prime of his life in terms of his vigor and efforts. Um, so at this time, Elector Duke Ernest Augustus commissioned Leibniz to connect the Brunswick, Brunswick House 
with to Charlemagne. So Charlemagne was the founder of the Holy Roman Empire, so this would have given a lot of clout, clout to the House of Hanover and sort of give them that divine right of kings that they needed to uh, attain the crown. So from 1687 to 1690, he traveled extensively in Germany, Austria, and Italy, and sort of just um, trying to trace back the roots. Um, unfortunately, uh, the uh, elector, um, de since decades had gone by with little work, the elector was very impatient and thought Vault uh, Leibniz to be doing poor work, uh, just using the salary for nothing. However, in the 19th century, he proved them to be wrong because he produced three huge volumes of work that did um, show that he was working. And perhaps um, it isn't written in English, but I assume it's probably pretty accurate. I guess they could have traced it back, the connection of the House of Hanover directly to Char Charlemagne. Um, at this time, he also served for a period as a librarian of Herzog August Library in Lower Saxony in 1691, where he started implementing his own cataloging system. So, um, he, uh, he delayed the, um, his visit back to Hanover until the end of 1676. And in this time, he visited uh, London. Um, and at that time, Newton accused um, Voltaire of, of, of seeing his unpublished work, thus concluding that Leibniz had plagiarized calculus. Um, I, 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 I think it's very, I think, the, I think this discovery of calculus was inevitable. I think it's an important and it's a necessary description of functions um, that um, was pretty much impossible um, to avoid. It is a little bit coincidental that they occurred at the same time, but you know they were also influenced by former um, um, uh, uh, discoverers of calculus as well. Um, I think based on Leibniz's character. In that, for example, with uh, with proving whether the Hanovers were related to Charlemagne, he waited until he had actually pr produced a suf sufficient amount of material before publishing it. I think that that uh, alludes to his integrity of work and um, not just striving to achieve fame. And I don't think that he did copy uh, Newton, but um, you can believe otherwise and. I, I think it's better to just remember history in that both were the victors. I think that is the best way to remember it. Um, he spent, uh, he also went to, um, uh, spent several intense days with Spinoza, um, who had just finished his masterwork on ethics, which um, I cover in a previous video. So. Um, ethics was hugely influential in terms of philosophy, and I imagine it was very influential on Leibniz and Leibniz's own philosophies. In 1677, he was promoted to the Privy Council, promoted to Privy Councillor of Justice, which he held for the rest of his life. He served three consecutive rulers of the House of Brunswick as a historian, politician, uh, political right advisor, and librarian, um, which actually was very important, particularly in respect to the librarian in producing records for the House of Hanover uh, and the history of the House of Hanover. He was pr um, promoted using, oh, at one time he promoted using windmills to improve mining in the House Harz Mountains, which the project was ultimately shut down in 1685. But I think this alluded to the later discovery of the combustion engine, which, um, um, it was it was mining in that uh, ultimately developed that discovery, and I think he was alluding to it. it he would just lacked the efficiency. So yeah. In seventeen o eight, John Keel, with Newton's blessing, accused um, for um, Leibniz formally of plagiarism, um, and it's what was known as the. 
uh, Tuculus priority dispute began, and the Journal of the Royal Society upheld the charge um, that Leibniz did copy it. So the British sort of um, abandoned Leibniz at this time. But um, there were many reasons why they did that. Firstly, perhaps because Newton was British and perhaps they just wanted to promote a, a local individual. Um, but either way, once again, I'd like to assume they were both the victors. In 1711, he met Tsar Peter the Great and they met with him in Hanover to discuss and um, Russia and Russian um, um, interests. And from then on, Leibniz became fascinated in the nation. In 1714, Queen Anne died and friend Dowager Electress Sophia died, um, which those were the, probably the, his two closest relations in the, the Brunswick community. King George I of Great Britain became king under the Act of Settlement, um, and Caroline of Ansbach in 1701, um, Princess of Wales, continued to vouch for Leibniz, so he still had one friend in the community. Uh, George I, however, did not include Leibniz in the court in London um, because for two reasons. Firstly, at this point, Leibniz still had not produced the volume of for Brunswick, the Brunswick families that was commissioned to link them to Charlemagne. And secondly, he did not want to insult Newton or the Royal Society. So Leibniz was essentially cut off despite um, Caroline of Ansbach vouching for him. In 1712, um, to, uh, he spent a two years residency at, as imperial court counselor to the Habs Habsburgs in Vienna. Um, and in 1716, um, he died in Hanover. Uh, none of George I's community and camp came to the, came to the funeral. Um, the Berlin Science Society didn't show either and um, to honor this individual so kind of a uh, kind of unfortunate it seems as though they all used him for political reasons used his mind for academic reasons and few showed up at his funeral despite him even being a lifelong member of the Berlin um, science society his ga grave remained unmarked for 50 years he was fortunately eulogized before the French Academy of Sciences as he was admitted as a foreign member on behalf on in 1700 but you know they originally rejected him as well so um it was kind of a um i don't know kind of uh um retroactive i i, I would say um the duchess of orleans um the niece of electress sophia was um there at the eulogy to present him um he never married he complained occasionally about money, but um, after his death, he gave his sole heir, his sister's stepson, a substantial sum of money. So it was evident that the Brunswicks did pay him well, despite him complaining about the money. Um, he backdated some manuscripts, which might be evidence that uh, he was maybe not ethical and might have perhaps copied some individuals such as uh, Newton. But... Um, uh, I think once we see Voltaire, I think using pseudonames and back um, backdating things was not uncommon, and I, I I'm sure that Newton probably had done similar things at some point as well. He could be sometimes unscrupulous with diplomatic endeavors, and um, obviously perhaps upset some people at some time at, occasionally. But he was known generally to be a charming and humorous, well-mannered individual with great creativity, and he had friends throughout Europe. And despite a few powerful people who who um, shamed him, the vast majority of people liked him. He was Protestant, but appreciated um, all aspects of religion, and he respected people of Catholicism. Um, unlike the common Protestant belief, he did not think the Pope was the Antichrist. Um, he's considered a philosophical theist, he um, or a uh, Trinitarian or follows a Trinitarian Christian God. Um, there's meaning there's one God, but three co-eternal persons, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, just some... Um, either way, he was, as we'll see, sort of with Voltaire, he was sort of religiously agnostic, but also religiously open and accepting. And generally, 
just a good person who was caught in the middle of a lot of um, political struggle and a lot of um, underlying uh, intentions. In terms of his thoughts, to briefly go on it before moving to Voltaire, most importantly, I think, for me, I find his theory of optimism to be fascinating in that um, God created, um, always chooses best, and the world is in, since since there is an infinite amount of ways it could have been arranged, it must have been done in the perfect way. We'll see how Voltaire um, sort of satirizes this, but I think it's a really interesting thought, and I think it is a positive thought. Um, another uh, key thought of his is the concept of monads, um, a metaphysical uh, theory, uh, or uh, which he wrote in monadology, in that the universe is comprised of an infinite number of simple substances, Sim kind of similar to court pulses, as we saw with Descartes, but um, each of these monads, so there's an infinite, is unique and changing, and sort of guided by the the will of God, as you will, um, and there's but their size can vary. So, for example, uh, this pen would be a monad, and um, however, I am also a monad, which is a, a, a much larger thing. Um, another another part of this um, is that um, the since all of this is predetermined by God. Everything is predetermined. For example, if you were to drop a cup, the cup breaks because the cup knows to break. That is what its um, objective is, that it was already supposed to fall, not because the ground was hard and broke it. So the, the cup breaks itself. So it's just sort of a different way of perceiving the world and perceiving how it operates or not even perceiving, supposedly, how it does operate. Um, once again, his binary um, system, base 2, was hugely important in, um, in developing computers later. He was considered a xenophile, so he was one of the first uh, Europeans, or very famous Europeans, to xenophile as one who's sort of interested in um, China, specifically. Um, he was particularly fascinated in Confucianism, so he brought a lot of Confucius's thoughts into his own. Um, and he actually looked at the, um, the Chinese characters uh, and, the, and believed there was some, perhaps unwittingly, some uh, uh, binary component to it. And in some way there are, and he really tried studying studying this extensively um it would be interesting because you know that if you if you look at a lot of chinese characters they are um some of them somewhat resemble what they do um what they mean but in most cases they're somewhat random so but they were you know the the language was not developed in a day like korean for example um not korean wasn't developed in a day but it was invented like put on a wall and like d designed that way whereas Chinese characters were developed over a long period of time so I think there is a little bit of a there is some probably something mathematical going on there which Leibniz tried discovering which is also fascinating and once again calculus his influence was hugely important even if you think that he might have plagiarized Newton at least his notation is the one we use today and lastly his influence on the royal family going towards the House of Hanover and George the First was hugely influential in terms of the, the changing of Britain to one that being Protestant. So yeah, we'll get I'll briefly talk about it more in the comparison, but now on to Voltaire. So Voltaire I think was one of the first the first times I really got um, interested in a philosopher. I, the first time I heard the quote I was um, I was asking a, an older friend of mine when I was really quite young. I said, um, "Who is an interesting philosopher?" And they're like, "Oh, it's got to be Voltaire." And they said, um, "They used this quote: I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend with defend the death your right to say it.'" And I thought that was just one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard. Um, and I think that really underlines really what philosophy is: is that you know, 
Voltaire and Leibniz do disagree on things, but they both believe that um, their ideas should be spread and heard. So he was a French Enlightenment writer, historian, philosopher. Um, he was known for his wittiness. Uh, he was a criticizer of Christianity at the time, especially the Roman Catholic Church. He was a famous advocate for free speech, freedom of religion, and separation of church and state. He was a versatile and prolific writer. He produced in almost every literary form, from plays to poems to novels to histories and scientific works. Um, he has written more than 20,000 letters and more than 2,000 books and pamphlets. He was outspoken with respect to civil liberties, and it was, which was quite risky considering the censorship laws in uh, France and in Europe at the time. He was considered a sat satirical polemicist, and he criticized intolerance of religion and the French institutions. So we'll get to this more, more detail, but I think if, any, if uh, he was... If anyone represents the Enlightenment, I really think Voltaire is, is probably a perfect example. So, he was born in Paris. He was the youngest of five children. His father was Francis, Francois Aret. Um, he was a lawyer and mi um, minor treasury official. His mother, Marie Marguerite Beaumard, was the lowest rank of the French nobility. So, once again, like Leibniz, um, you consider upper middle class or lower upper class, but both with a, a, a desire to, to climb. There's speculation about his birth because Voltaire claimed he was born on February 20th, 1694, as the illegitimate son of a nobleman, Guerin de Rocheburn. Um, however, others say it was 21st of November, so I think it's the, the date in this case is less important than the fact that he was in, interested in changing it which I think, um, once again, alludes to his character. Um, he, his two older brothers, two of his older brothers, died in infancy. Um, so his remaining brother, Armand, and sister, Marguerite, Catherine, were nine and seven years older, however. So, in all intents and purposes, he was somewhat of an only child, given the age gap. He was nicknamed by his family as Zorro, or also called at some times Le Volontaire, which is the little volunteer, which is not necessarily um, the literal sense, but volunteer in that he was, um, or volunteer in that he was uh, determined and was willing to take on any tasks. He was baptized on the 22nd of November. Uh, he was educated by um, a, a Jesuit, a, a, Jesu a prestigious Jesuit college. Um, in Paris, um, called uh, Louis Salle Grand, Collège Louis Salle Grand, I think, je pense. Um, he was taught Latin, theology, and rhetoric, which was common teachings at a, at a Jesuit college. Um, and he later became fluent in Italian, Spanish, and English. So he would have definitely been a, a, considered a polyglot. Um, interesting, Leibniz actually never wrote anything in English, despite having spent so much time in uh, in England, which I think was interesting to know. Um, he grad um, after he graduated, he wanted to be a writer. His father, um, despite his, his uh, against his father's wishes, that he become a lawyer. Kind of perhaps maybe a similar thing that that which was going on with Leibniz, but Leibniz actually did become a lawyer, but Voltaire had no interest in doing so. So he pretended to be an assistant to a notary in Paris while he was actually writing poetry. Um, his father eventually found out and sent him to Caen um, sent, um, in Normandy to go and study law. But he continued to write and um, while there, producing essays and historical studies. His wit made him popular amongst the aristocratic families very early on. So. He was already sort of punching above his weight class, one might say. In 1713, his father obtained a job for him as secretary to the new French ambassador in the Netherlands, Marquis de Chateauneuf, um, who is actually the brother of his godfather. So it, um, he was um, 
um, ambassador in the ha in the Netherlands. So in the Hague, he fell in love with an individual named or a woman named Catherine Olim uh, Donoyer, uh, who he called Pimpet, um, who was a French Protestant. So I guess um, at this point he started. Firstly, it uh, shows what a romantic was. He has very many um, lovers throughout his life, but it's they aren't superficial lovers. He um, he obviously changed a lot, but when he loved, I think he loved very intensely. But uh, also, it alludes to his religious intolerance because she was a, a Protestant and he was um, a Catholic. So um, this was found out by his um, by Chateauneuf and was considered scandalous. So his father forced him to return to France by the end of the year. Um, after returning, he spent most of his time in Paris. Um, in this time, he was ultimately sentenced to prison twice and one time exiled to England, as we'll, I'll explain soon. Um, he, he, uh, one of the times he was sentenced to prison was he accused the regent of incest with his daughter, and he spent 11 months in Bastille. Um, at, but soon after being released the, at the Comédie Française, which is um, main, one of the main places to play comedy plays in Paris at the time, they staged his first play in 1718, his debut play, Oedipus, which soon after, the, soon after his release from Bastille, and this gave him immediate financial and critical success. The regent and King George I of Great Britain presented him with medals of appreciation. So that's the same King George I who did not appreciate Leibniz is giving Voltaire, who um, criticizes kings of incest, um, uh, they're giving him with medals. So very different, um, very different there. Um, already then he started to... Um, uh, uh, um, promote a campaign to eradicate a less uh, priestly and aristomonarchal um, uh, monarchy, aristocratic monarchy. So he was already pushing to uh, separate church, church and state and sort of the uh, big class divide that was very evident, particularly evident at this time uh, leading up to the French Revolution. At this time, he started changing his name. Uh, he adopted the name of Voltaire in 1718, soon after his incarceration in Bastille. There's multiple things that it could mean. It could be an anagram of his name, Arovetli, which is the Latinized spelling of his surname, um, Aret, and Le Jeune, which is the young, um, perhaps so. Uh, uh, or um, also, he was known among, in his family as Le Petit Volontaire, as mentioned previously previously, um, the little volunteer, the little determined one, um, or it could be a reversed syllable, uh, re or reversed syllables of Erivolt, which is the family's hometown in uh, Puto, or it could be um, similar to words such as voltige, which is acrobatics on a trapeze horse, or volte, which is uh, spinning about to face one's, or Volt face, which is spinning about to face one's enemies, or um, other. On the flip side, it could be to avoid his current name, Aruet, which was not noble and sounded similar to Aroué, which is to be beat up, or Roué at debauche. So, and most directly, he says in a quote that um, um, he simply did not like the sound of his old name, um, but I think I think that all of these things led to the fact. Firstly, he liked the sound, the the weightlessness and youngness of the sound of Voltaire, and he disliked his current name. So I think all are true, and I think he put a lot of thought into it because he came across many different pen names throughout his life, but Voltaire was the most popular, his favorite as well. In terms of his early fiction, his next play, Art Artemer, opened in 1720, which takes place in Macedon, which was an absolute flop, um, and only fragments of the play actually exist to this day. He turned to an epic poem about Henry IV of France, 
um, which he was denied license to publish um, in France. So in 1722, he headed north uh, to find a publisher outside of France. He brought Mistress Maurice Margaret de Rompemond, um, a young widow with him, um, probably a second lover of his. Um, his father died at this point. So at this point, Voltaire was already showing that he was free and wasn't going to listen to his father, but now he had sort of absolute control to do whatever he wanted. He met with Rousseau briefly in Brussels, um, which would be important because I think both influenced each other um, quite heavily. And both were probably um, maybe the most important individuals in the um, leading up to the French Revolution. He found, ultimately found a publisher in The Hague, um, and he was impressed by the openness and tolerance of the Netherlands, and this was probably things that were heavily influenced by Spinoza as well. Um, after this publication, he returned to France, and he found a second publisher in Rouen um, for Le Henriade, which is the, his epic uh, poem on Henry IV of France, um, but it was to be published secretly. He had smallpox for one month. Um, in 1723, first copies were smuggled and distributed, which were an instant success. He soon made a new play called Maryam, which was a failure um, in 1724. He reworked the play, however, um, and it was played at the Comédie Française in 1724, later that year, and with a much improved reaction, and it was ultimately played at the wedding of Louis XV and Mary. Uh, Lesinchenska in September of 1725. So I guess once again, um, the little determined thing, the play was a flop, but he reworked it because he knew it had potential and it ended up being a hit to be played at a king's wedding. Um, he spent some time at Chateau de Circe uh, in 1733, Emily de Châtelet. Um, he had a 16 year affair with this woman who was 12 years younger uh, she was a mathematician, and she was a married mother of three. So um, Vol Voltaire knew no, his love knew no bounds. He didn't care if they were married, had kids, they were younger. Um, but he, he certainly loved this woman as well. At Circe de Sur Blaise, the, um, which is between Champagne and Lorraine, if you know um, the regions of France, he, um, he paid for the renovations of the chateau, and even the husband he got along pretty pretty well with so together they studied the natural science um, nature um, particularly the nature of fire and amassed 21,000 books which was a, 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 is still even a massive library um, private library today um, uh, probably he was interested in the natural science partially by the inspiration of Newton um, he also got fascinated in optics um, supposedly, he actually wrote a book on Newton. Here is actually an image of one of the books he wrote on Newton. Um, here is um, Emily, one of his lovers, um, dictating it to him, and uh, um, this is him writing on Newton. Uh, supposedly, the the story of the uh, the um, where the apple falls on Newton's head on the tree might be completely fictitious, and um, it was actually written by Voltaire. So, once again. Um, yeah, he uh, wrote many letters during this time, which are still very important pieces of um, of writings to this day. And but this time he was mostly um, writing on science, and they were less offensive than some of the things he had previously written, and particularly with respect to the things he would soon write. He spent some time in Great Britain in early seventeen twenty six. A French nobleman taunted him um, about his name change to Voltaire, and he replied with this quote um, that uh, his name would be honored while Rohan would dishonor his. Uh, this was Rohan de Chevalier. So I think that's kind of a, a, a nice, well, not a nice way to put it, but. Um, it, he completely justified his own name and criticized the other person. It's just a testament to his wit. Um, he says, I will honor mine while you would dishonor your own. So um, uh, 
Chevalier de Rohan had him beat up by thugs. Um, Voltaire requested a duel. Voltaire was always very boisterous and ready to defend for himself. But the uh, aristocratic family um, instead had him imprisoned in Bastille. So despite Voltaire's fame, um, he couldn't really fight against those more powerful. He was given no trial or defense. So fearing an indefinite sentence, he offered to exile himself to England, which was accepted. Um, so he sent off to England in 1726. He lived mostly in Wandsworth um, with a friend, Everard Faulkner, who's um, basically famous for his, asso with, for his association with Voltaire. Uh, in December 1727 um, to June of 1728 he lived on maiden lane in covent garden um where there's actually a, a commemorated plaque if you ever go to covent gardens in london um to be nearer to the british publisher he circulated amongst the high society with alexander pope john gay jonathan swift lady mary wortley montagu and sarah duchess of marlborough so also the nobility as well um, supposedly he was even at Newton's funeral and perhaps maybe even had some sort of relationship with Newton's niece as well. He was intrigued by Britain's constitutional monarchy, which was heavily contrasted uh, with, um, with France's absolute monarchy. Um, he got interested in English literature particularly Shakespeare, before Shakespeare was considered famous. So kind of like Newton, um, would Shakespeare and Newton be as famous as they are today without Voltaire? Well, at least Newton would not have been read in France, which would have been a big um, difference. And perhaps Shakespeare might have been less famous without Voltaire, it's hard to say, but um, it's interesting to note. Um, he actually praised Although the, the English plays were less polished than those in France, the on-stage action, as evident in Shakespeare's, was uh, very impressive. But later, once France did adopt it, he considered it um, barbarous. So he thought it was kind of uh, flip-flop back and forth, basically. Basically, I think he liked what's new and disliked anything that was uh, popular in France at the time. In 1727, in English, published Upon the Civil Wars of France, um, which he extracted from various manuscripts, and Upon Epic Poetry of European, European Nations, Nations, from Homer to Milton. Milton. So, so kind of, of as, as um, he, he was also a bit of a biography, and he also was great at writing in English, which is important to note, unlike Leibniz. And um, yeah, so... Not only was he an artist, he also was a, a fascinated in history as well. He, in, on his return, um, two years later to France, he slowly moved back. He spent two months in Dieppe first and then moved to Paris. Um, or he, A French mathematician um, proposed buying up the lottery to pay off the French government debts um, for about one million, um, which made him... Very rich, approximately one million French livres, which was this was promoted to him or suggested to him by Charles Marie de Condamine, a, um, a Jewish financier at the time. Um, he was granted control over um, his father's trust because he, at this point, had proven that he was um, financially stable, and at this point, he was it's called considered indisputably rich. So perhaps. Um, uh, moving up the, the economic hierarchy, but still, because of his actual real name, he could never be really considered upper, upper class or high nobility. In 1733, he produced a play called Zaire, which he dedicated to Faulkner, his friend in the United Kingdom, um, and he praised English liberty and commerce in this writing. He also, um, and he wrote letters um, concerning the English nation, um, and essays in London and letters. Um, particularly in France, he wrote uh, Letters Philosophiques, which um, praised the English system over the French, which was publicly burned in France, and he was forced to flee Paris again. 
He spent some time in Chateau de Sucy, um, where he wrote Elements of Newton, which is this book here. Um, and he began to oppose uh, Leibniz at this time, perhaps because he just liked Newton. Um, uh, and he obviously brought Newton to a larger audience. And yeah, he, he studied more history at this time as well in Chateau de Sucy. Um, and he formulated his perspectives most notably at this time. He criticized the Bible as well because, and he did some extensive reading on that as well. In 1736, Frederick the Great, the Crown Prince of Prussia and admirer of Voltaire, um, he began a correspondence with him that uh, uh, would be may mark a huge change in his life. In Holland in 1736, or late 1736, he met scientists Hermann Boer uh, and William Jacobs Gravis Gravisand. Um, so, un uh, although he was very aware of the scientific community, Newton and all these individuals, um, there isn't as much known about his actual contributions to the sciences or mathematics, but he was f certainly familiar with it. And it, even in his writings, it's evident that he was um, well versed and educated in these regards. In Brussels, he spent some time with the Marquise, um, uh, unsuccessfully fighting the six-year-old family in a le legal case for two uh, he he was sent by the Marquis um, to um, Brussels to fight for a legal case uh, for two estates in Limburg, which ultimately failed. He spent some time at the Hague, where he first met Frederick, um, the great Crown Prince of Prussia, um, at a cra castle near Cleves. Um, and he wrote, so at the time, the Crown Prince was writing a book on called Anti Machiavel which is a chapter-by-chapter chapter rebuttal of The Prince by Machiavelli. Um, I think it was more done, once again, for as was The Prince, it was done for political purposes, but Voltaire helped him in writing this. In 1743, he was sent to Frederick the Great's court, um, as a, um, actually as a French spy, um, for military um, intentions regarding the war of the Austrian secession. Um, in 1744, he was confined to a chateau, um, and the Marquis found a new lover, so Voltaire um, was no longer uh, in a kind of pseudo-relationship, and he fell in love with another individual called Marie-Louis Mignon, um, and they had many uh, beautiful romantic letters of correspondence. Um, Originally, supposedly, it was a very sexual relationship, but later turned into a platonic one and lasted until his death. So that's also important to note. He wasn't just a, a, a crazy, lustful individual, but he was also um, dedicated to this woman even in his later years. So a true romantic, one might say. So he was sent to Prussia um, in 1749 after the Marquis died in childbirth. Um, uh, well, sorry, the Marquis died in childbirth in 1749, and he moved to Prussia in 1715 at the invitation of Frederick the Great, his new friend. Um, and Louis the Fifteenth gave him permission because he wanted Voltaire to be a spy anyways. He was made Chamberlain to the House and appointed to the Order of Merit. He had a salary of 20,000 French livres, which he hardly needed because he was already a rich playwright and inheritant and one who made lots of money in finances. Um, he completed a satire novel, Micromigas, uh, which is one of the incredibly important book because it was one of the first science fiction um, books about uh, basically these ambassadors from another planet come down to observe Earth and observe its follies. So satire and science fiction, which was really not a, not a, uh, a type of literature at the time. Frederick acute later though, however, accused him of theft and for forgery by a um, Jewish financier. Um, supposedly it was something, it was more personal than that, but uh, nonetheless he was accused. And Mopertuis, uh, president of the Berlin Academy of Science, uh, the same one that did not respect Leibniz's death, um, 
started uh, speaking out against Voltaire because he had an argument with the president, a uh, formal rival for Emily's affection as well, so a romantic rival. Um, Voltaire wrote a biting diatribe uh, uh, called Diatribe du, du Ton Akakia, I believe. Um, which satirized the theories and abuse of power in the Berlin Science Academy. So Frederick had all of Voltaire's books burnt. Um, Voltaire offered to resign and return his signia. Um, he refused and then accepted, and he was detained by agents. Uh, Marie-Louis, um, his love was even uh, supposedly experienced unwanted sexual advances. I assume that's like um, sexual harassment, maybe even rape, which um, is a very common theme in some of his books um and yeah he argued him and um the king of prussia strange enough were arguing over possession of a book um so voltaire was robbed and ransacked and after the seven after the seven years war um him and the king of prussia actually surprisingly reconciled but despite this um he was sort of forced to leave with a very unfortunate manner um, he spent some time in Geneva and Ferney, so he slowly returned back to Paris. In 1754, Louis XV um, was banned from Paris. Um, oh, sorry, banned Voltaire from Paris, so he bought an estate in Geneva called Les Delicas. Um, and his per performances, theatrical performances, were banned, and publication of Maid of Orleans was also banned. He brought later bought a larger estate in Fernie, um, which he lived at for 20 years, which is on the French side of the Franco-Swiss border, so he finally made it back to France at this point. In 1759, he published Candide ou l'Optimism. So this was, um, uh, I actually have a little copy here. I, I bought this little book in France. It's uh, very, like, I recommend this to anyone. It's a really, e it's a really easy read. Um, it, um, by Voltaire, and this is where it directly contrasts Leibniz. So, um, it, it, the the title character is Candide, um, which essentially um, is, is a joke because he's supposed to be naive. Because he, basically everything that could go wrong goes wrong for this individual. Um, he loses his wife. Um, there's tons of rape. He loses all of his wealth, and all this time he's with this sort of philosopher and his philosopher is essentially Leibniz he says oh it's it's God's will and Candide is so so um, finds it so strange that the world can be so cruel if everything is made perfect by God um, and I'll get to the conclusion of um, what how he concludes it later but it's just an absolute uh, beautiful read but I'll get into the his actual philosophy at the, the very end um, and it's also, it's probably his best known work, at least I know it to be his best known work, um, that and Dictionnaire Philosophique, which he produced at that point as well, which is probably one of the most important parts of the French Enlightenment. In 1764, that's when he produced the Dictionnaire Philosophique, which is a series of articles mainly on Christian history and dogmas. Um, he was visited by James Boswell, Adam Smith, Jack, uh, Giacomo Casanova and Edward Gibbon, so he was, um, he did not um, produce this Dictionnaire Philosophique and his great works in, um, in isolation. In 1762, um, he was unjustly uh, persecuted, um, he was, uh, and later in his life, starting in 1762, he was a champion of unjustly persecuted people. So most famously, uh, Huguenot Jean Calas um, was uh, um, was persecuted for um, as a result of religious intolerance, and Voltaire successfully overturned the charges and defended the individual. In 1778, a month before his death, he was initiated into Freemasonry in Paris at La Loge des Neuf Sœurs, um, perhaps at the request of Benjamin Franklin, um, who was visiting France at the time. Um, in anticipation for the American um, Revolution. Um, I think that's important to note that he was a Freemason. Um, I have the Freemason symbol down here. I think that um, 
I, 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 I would like to become a Freemason, actually, in my own life. I, uh, after being fascinated in Benjamin Franklin, Voltaire, and particularly I'm reading War and Peace by Tolstoy. And the most important character is Pierre, who's supposed to represent um, um, Tolstoy, is, becomes a Freemason, and is really heavily influential on his life. I think it's, it's not the, the evil society that people believe in. It. It's about brotherhood, and it's about facilitating um, good character. Um, in 1778... Uh, for the first time, he returned to Paris in 25 years at the opening of his latest tragedy and final tragedy, Irene. Um, it was a five-day journey for an 83-year-old man. Um, he was supposedly at this time defiant, tormented. Um, perhaps he was repenting, um, uh, criticizing Catholicism. And when he did die, he was refused burial in Paris and instead buried at Abbey of Scaleries in Champagne. In 1791, he moved, he was later moved to the Pantheon um, in anticipation for the, the revolution. Um, and there were one million deaths at that moving of his, uh, of his burial to the Pantheon. So, um, yeah, I guess to talk briefly about his thoughts, and then I actually, I noticed I missed some of the quotes for uh, um, Leibniz, so I'll go through those as well. But um, in terms of his philosophy, uh, firstly, um, religious tolerance. Um, he was both a champion and advocate for religious tolerance in his own life and in his own writing. Um, secondly, freedom of speech. And he did that by being free in his own speech and saying that which he believed. And... Um, uh, he, I think he was a symbol of love and romanticism, which um, there are few and far between in a society. And then, um, yeah, I think I'll go through the quotes on Leibniz and then I'll, I'll talk about the comparison. So um, we had this one, God assuredly always chooses best, that's optimism. Uh, monads are the ultimate units of existence in nature. He who hasn't tasted bitter things hasn't earned sweet things. So that's just sort of the balance of life. Um, you know, happiness doesn't exist without sadness. Um, I think that's true. I think a lot of people today expect to be happy all the time. I think that's an impossible fallacy. Um, I don't want to um, divert too much, but there's a, an individual I know said, uh, one, uh, one in five people suffer from depression and i think that's just just a wrong statistic because firstly it makes makes depressed people feel like they've got some sort of disease i know there is chronic depression which is um does affect some people but a different way to take the same figure is not that one in five 20 percent of people have depression it's that people are depressed 20 percent of the time it's just a way of flipping the statistic and it, some people swing more, some people are bipolar, but that's a better way of addressing it rather than if someone is depressed saying like, oh, you have something that other people don't and sort of isolating them. But uh, I'm, I'm going on a tangent. Uh, nothing is necessitated who oppose it, uh, oppose is possible. So this is just one of his um, uh, perhaps maybe scholastic beliefs in that, you know, if something is uh is not true therefore the opposite is true and vice versa um if you could blow up blow the brain up to the size of a mill and walk about inside you would not find consciousness so that's an interesting one um people still um still haven't discovered consciousness hundreds of years later um will they will we be able to discover it i don't know i just thought that was fascinating and as mentioned earlier, a glass shatters because it knows it has hit the ground and not because the impact with the ground compels the glass to split, which is a pre-established harmony or God in effect, God assuredly always chooses best. Now to um, Voltaire's quotes, which um, many of which are very famous. Um, and we mentioned this one. If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. So although he did criticized the Catholic Church. Um, he was 
very open to religious tolerance and just the idea of religion generally. Common sense is not so common, a common quote. Um, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Um, that's interesting, um, interesting and almost ironic as he would be the one to sort of perhaps spark the um, French Revolution where many atrocities did occur. Judge of a man by his questions rather than by his answers. I think that's a beautiful one and that's a good way just to uh, live by. God is a comedian playing to an audience too afraid to laugh. Uh, I think that's that's funny. So I guess we can start talking about the, the book Candide, which is so famous. So um, the world is um, essentially so cruel and how is it possible that God could have created it? And Voltaire experienced his own fair share of hardness, uh, perhaps maybe more so than Leibniz. Maybe that's why he thought that Leibniz could be wrong. Voltaire's uh, lover was um, sexually assaulted. Um, in the book, he writes about all the rape and killings. Um, he did not even live through the, the French Revolution, and that would have made it hard to believe that God always chooses what's rest, uh, which, which is best. Um, but at the very end of the book, um, he has, I'll go through these last two quotes first, but love truth, but pardon error. That's a good one. I die adoring God, loving my friends, not hating my enemies and detesting superstition. So he's not saying that Leibniz is, um, wrong or overly optimist, optimistic at the very end of the book. He has this quote, um, which I think a lot of places misquoted, but either way that here is how it is. This is well said, replied Candide but we must tend to our garden. So the discussion goes at the end of the book, all these things had bad, bad had happened to them. Um, also, they had their fair share of goodness as well, but the vast majority of bad things, um, killings, rape, murder. Um, but at the end of the day, we must tend to our garden. And there's a lot of um, different uh, interpretations of what this means, but but basically it's kind of a um, just a, a step back and just create goodness um, out of nothing and don't maybe in uh, to criticize Leibniz in this respect don't assume that everything will be good make the good um, I think that's what he was trying to allude to so yeah I think that that is the that, that is the main point of con uh, con um, contrast where the two individuals contrast each other and uh, they're both very optimistic people despite their poor mistreatment uh, that's why I think they're both uh, amazing individuals who inspire me and I hope perhaps might inspire you so thanks for so much for watching this video and uh, yeah I hope you continue to support thanks